if the kid or the student has the drive and yeah. the will, want, and desire yeah. to to uh, accomplish anything, and not only automotive but any trade, you know, uh, they can. You know, and, and Diamond provides that in, in a way that that is very unique, meaning that here in the shop, as you saw out there in the shop, we are a full service shop slash garage. Yep. I've been here since 1976, first as a student and then as a substitute teacher. Um, I've taught in both the vocational and academic settings. So yeah, I, I, I just by virtue of, 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 of being here a long time, you, you sort of build a little bit of institutional history that uh, allows for uh, a way of both looking forward and back at the same time. And that's important because in order to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. So. Um, so I think I think that is an advantage. But you know, Tom, I want to be clear. This this is a this is a team approach. We have a phenomenal team here, and I, I feel extremely lucky to be the superintendent director. The past two years, we've turned away a high number of students that wanted our shop because we can only accept 20 new freshmen into the program every year. I believe that we had in excess of 50 students select the, the shop. HVAC shop with their first choice, and we're only allowed to take 20. Realistically, we, uh, we received over 800 applications for 375 spots. So um, that, is, that is a problem that a renovation uh, just can't fix. Uh, because again, the building, when it was originally built in 1968, uh, the, the number was around 800 students. And so it's not just a matter of trying to you know, offer the types of programs, both academically and vocationally, that students from all of these communities deserve, uh, but also the infrastructure that supports that kind of learning is, is being stretched to a point. And it's one of the challenges we face because you know, when people come here, uh, they'll say, oh, the building looks great. Um, you know, I, I liken it to a, a, a car that's in deep trouble with an outstanding paint job. On the outside, it looks really good, but you know, in terms of the actual workings, uh, there are many shortcomings and problems that uh, I, I think of renovation are going to be very difficult in fixing. And we've even had the discussion with our administrators about the potential for when we do have our new facility, mm -hmm. about the potential for a clinic um, that would be uh, where our students would work, and it would be a combination of the health assisting students, the dental assisting students, and the new medical assisting. Um, program that, that they're looking to start, which is currently in the process of getting uh, going through the approval process, we're looking to perhaps pioneer that, um, where Good our idea. students would be able to um, get the care that they need um, and still have the learning uh, yeah. going on, the real life learning. We would love to have a uh, dental clinic here where we could bring in dentists and um, service our community, service our students, and um, in that way the students could stay here for their clinical rotations. We could keep an eye on things better. Um, that's what we would like to see happen. It would have to have a separate building, separate entrances. Uh, one of the challenges with these clinical rotations is we don't have one place where we can bring everyone. We, dental offices are small, so we can drop maybe one student off at that office, one at a different one. It takes us an hour to deliver all the students to the various dental offices, yeah. and then someone has to check on the students. Um, so if we had a dental school in, in town or nearby, we could go to that one spot and keep an eye on everyone. Yeah. So the dental clinic would eliminate that. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be pretty exciting. I see 10 from 15 years from now, we, we had better have our own bank on campus, which we will be running uh, with, with a partnership, hopefully with someone here local, like, like yeah. a Bank 5 yeah. or, or a forward municipal credit union. We should be running our own bank. We sh our students should be out there. We should be having, um, I don't want to say think tanks, but we should have, be opening up micro companies where our, much what they're doing on the college level now, we should be doing it, but we should be doing it with internet, with internet based programs, internet based uh, companies and services, and so that our students are out there because they can do the work. They have the skills. We've seen it already. Ready. It's just now taking the vehicle. How do we get that out there where our students are not just doing simulations but are working on real life um, businesses and programs and their own, much like a, an MIT or a Harvard will do, where mm -hmm. they're graduating and they're graduating entrepreneurs already. That would be our, uh, our long-term goal. We're just such a high need of a new school and, and better resources. We do our best and the kids are great and the kids learn and they go out and they become successful, but it's, it's so frustrating to know how much better it could be. We're not working on, you know, 
projects this big. We're working with cars. Yep. You know, 15 feet long, 12 feet long, 20 feet long. Um, we're doing some work for the community, uh, work for the school here as well. You know, we painted railings and uh, miscellaneous fences and other pieces for the community that aren't necessarily cars, but they're large items. Yeah. You know, so nothing that we're working on is small. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and when we do work with one panel, we've got 10 students working with one panel. Um, you know, we're looking at so many different challenges and our staff is excited about, you know, doing the legwork necessary to meet those challenges, but are restricted by the limitations of this building and there are many. We, we all do need space. It's funny how, how you yeah. said that, but we all do need. We, we started up um, a DECA chapter this year at Diamond and um, part of a DECA chapter would be to have a store, but we don't have a footprint for a store in the school. Yeah. So, I mean, we're looking at uh, doing an online store or doing something uh, something creative like that for now, but I mean, yeah. the goal is to incorporate marketing or, or sales and stuff with the store, with, with the shop, yeah. to do to personalize items and stuff like sweatshirts or, um, you know, because all, all schools sell sweatshirts and t-shirts for their school. Uh, we actually have the capability here to embroider it or, or to, to personalize it with your name or whatever you yeah. want. So um, that's kind of our goal, is, is, to, is to look for that, for that in, the, in the future. Um, hopefully have a real store. We're in the middle of a partnership right now with Newark um, Naval Underwater uh, System Center out in uh, Middletown. They, um, they brought us some, um, some parts and a 3D scanner because they're looking to do some research. They would be able, like to be able to scan a part when they're on a submarine and say a part is broken, scan a part, um, put it into the software and then print it, 3D print it in metal. These are things that they're looking to do in the future because they don't necessarily have these parts in stock. Yeah. Uh, they could be in another country, they could be in Guam where there yeah. isn't yeah. Any, any resources and they want to be able to self-sustain themselves with these older submarines. We, we could actually print prototypes for them yeah. in our machines, but they're looking to print working metal parts. Yeah. Or it could be plastic, it could be a part that's plastic, but yeah. something that they wouldn't have to necessarily keep in stock, all they would need is the machine to produce. So to be able to situate ourselves so that our, my students can work with the students in the other uh, in the other shops would be fa fantastic. Yep. We are right next door to electronics, which is great. So yep. when we, when our students get to be juniors, I believe, sophomores or juniors, we're actually going to see if we can do something with robotics along with the electronics yep. department to kind of... Technology has changed and with that, but you still need your, your, your graphics people, your design people, your, your plumbers, your electricians and stuff, and yep. that's what the school is, is providing. Is providing all those services that, that we need to, to survive. You know, your, your culinary arts, um, all of them. I mean, we all fit together to, to make the world work. So at the moment, our seniors are actually working on projects in the school, which is great because they get real life experience on, on working with customers. In this case, it's like the other shop instructors, some of the administration team, but we get that, we get to build those soft skills that the students can work with the administrators and kind of we, we treat them as customers. So if, if they're not acting appropriately as, you know, as polite technicians, we can kind of work on those soft skills at the same time as working on the technical skills. It's, it's, it's kind of difficult simulating customer relations in our shop environment. It's great to learn the technical skills, but when the seniors are around the school, fixing things around the school, they can get those soft skills for working with the customers also. And, uh, it saves the school money. These students feel the satisfaction of going around the school and having our superintendent or having our shop instructors or you know giving them a great pat in the back like thanks a lot you helped us a lot. It's, it just adds tangible real life value to what they're doing and it, it adds that much more interest to the the actual task. Uh, one thing that we do have here at Diamond is the house building program uh, which has been great. Uh, students get out there from the carpenters to the electricians to um, some of the facility management uh, for masonry and for landscaping duties, um, for painting, for sheetrocking, for insulating, um, of course plumbing and heating, yeah. HVAC apartment out there. So it's great to see the kids collaborating and working together in the field getting that real life experience. Um, the other thing is we're involved in the communities from Swansea, Somerset to Westport and of course Fall River where we've done work inside the fire departments, getting heating systems updated, um, get them up and running, ready for the winter. 
uh, whether it's um, getting them at, from season to season, whether it's uh, bathroom remodels, um, whatever it is, that they're out there getting that hands-on experience and helping the community, being involved, and exactly saving the city money. Yeah, I'm extremely proud of, of the inclusiveness of, of our teaching faculty and the fact that we have a lot of non-traditional students who are doing very nicely in, in, in areas of construction, welding, machine tool, you know, advanced manufacturing. And so, you know, again, it, the idea, and it's what makes Exploratory so great, is that the students who come in are able to explore 12 programs. A lot of them don't know that these programs even exist as, as an eighth grader, but once they get here, they realize, oh, I've never heard of advanced manufacturing, but wow, I really like the type of programming that you're doing and, and the problem solving that goes with that program. The average age of a machinist in the state of Massachusetts is 58. I just found that out the other day. So there's a future. So there's a tremendous demand because there was always, you know, everybody had this concept or this notion that, and it did happen in the 80s that a lot of manufacturing went overseas. But advanced manufacturing, the high-tech manufacturing, and you know, you're still going to get a lot of stuff from China and Japan and yeah. India. But the real advanced, you know, like knee replacements, a lot of medical stuff, um, Department of Defense, that's all manufactured here. And what's happening is there's such a gap because people didn't get involved in the machine tool trade because they said, oh, there's no future in it. Well, now it's through the roof. It's absolutely through the roof. We have more jobs than we have students. Co-op job. We're very, very proud of, of the fact that we, uh, you talked about the community, yeah. and that we service, you know, non-profit organizations, you know, and that people that are needy, people that call us or call me here or call any one of the instructors here, they're usually people that, that can't afford repairs on the outside. Right. And, and we uh, go ahead, provide and, that service. Yeah, sure. And uh, on, on, on the cuff, there's no charge other than they pay for the parts. Yeah. But, um, and uh, more people, saying really, really good things about Diamond and it's particularly our shop. And it makes, the, it makes us very part of what we do here on a daily basis. Well, because we have a lot of students that apply to be into our program as freshmen. I think for the past few years, every student that has been placed, it's been the number one choice that they've selected. Yes, uh -huh. it has. Yeah. Yeah. And we turn away students who are choosing this as their first choice program. Come in in September, our freshman class, and they'll explore, explore all the shops throughout the school every three days. So they can get a look and see, and they can look around them what upperclassmen are doing in that particular area. And at the end of the calendar year in December, uh, they'll make a choice. I believe it's one, two, three for a second and third choices and they'll turn their choices into the uh, office here at Diamond for the PPS and they'll take all those choices and place students in the shops that they're requesting. They try to do that 100% and, and they, do, they have a pretty good track record. You know, there's this idea out there that if you are at Diamond, you either have to say you support you know, the students going into the workforce exclusively or to go into college exclusively. It's not the way you know, the market works today. Uh, we have students who, who do both. Um, I'm proud of the fact that our incredibly successful cooperative education program has allowed students to make money to be able to go to college and interestingly enough um, there's such great employees that the employers sometimes keep them on part-time while they're going to college. By the same token we have a number of students who uh, go directly into the workforce and actually take college courses while they're working. And uh, I can't believe the amount of projects we've done for the communities. Yeah. You know, we've saved the communities yeah. loads of money. Um, and, uh, you know, it was always great projects. Yeah. We also did the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, yeah, we did, did the uh, visiting center, the yeah. uh, reception area. So we made uh, new, new countertops. We made all new reception desks. Uh, we made brochure cabinets. And it, it's a really nice piece. If you get the chance to go by there and actually see what dining has done, especially, yeah. especially when it's the face of the city, when people come to see the city and hopefully bring their business to the, the Fall River, uh, right, uh, right away they can see some of, of our work. Uh, we, we actually we do a lot of work for us. Uh, we do a lot of work for the sending schools too. Um, so like Case, uh, we do work for Durfee. We do work for um, Westport. Um, so we do work for the surrounding towns that, that um, whatever they need. Um, we also do work for, for nonprofit organizations. Yeah. So if they need tickets, uh, we'll we'll do their tickets. We'll do programs. We'll do banners. Uh, we do embroidery for uh, for the for the youth court, for the Forever Youth Court. Just like out in Westport at the DP 
uh, DPW building um, a few years back, we did brand new heating system in there, high efficiency. Wow. So, I mean, it's great to have those students to be able to go out in the surrounding towns in the city of Fall River to perform that live work. Like I said, whether it's old school buildings that we're going in rehabbing, whether it's firehouses that they're working on the heating systems, um, it's just all around great experience for them. We have a few students working on high-tech military projects in different companies yeah. and quite a few over an electric boat yeah. uh, building submarines. It, it came apart in sections. But uh, we actually took part of that uh, reception area back to the shop, uh, which was a large piece, and we had to get a flatbed in order to get it here to the school. Sure. Then we customized it to an ADA uh, compliance, yeah. and also made nice Korean countertops to go on top. And then basically we brought it back to the to Somerset Library, and uh, we moved the whole uh, reception area from one area to the other yes, uh, with the students, and we customized uh, the rest of the counters and built all Korean countertops, and it was a great project for the kids. Oh, yeah. It was a great challenge, and yeah. uh, you know, the kids uh, met the challenge. They, uh, they stepped up. You need infrastructure, and the contractors need experienced uh, tradesmen to, uh, to execute their work. Uh, some of our largest, largest electrical contractors in the area are all Diamond graduates. Mm -hmm. And that infrastructure is spread out between manufacturing, where they have maintenance electricians, right out to the contractor doing service calls, uh, to the ground up contractors who are doing the industrial and commercial work. A lot of their employees are coming out of this program. Our shop is, is turning to a direction where the industry is going, where yeah. drafters and designers are actually creating parts. We have some students who are working at, uh, at um, fabrication labs, 3D printing labs, where their job is to uh, load, the, load the printers, unload the printers, clean the printers. Um, that's a lot to do with, I mean, not only just putting the, the, the file in there and printing it, there's a little more to it. There's cleaning them out, maintaining them, loading new material, uh, post-processing operations where the student takes the part out of the printer and maybe has to do some cleaning up and some sanding and finishing up the part where it's actually presentable as a working part. They go out into the community, they do this work, and it's a value added for a lot of these communities yeah. that don't have to pay to have yep. this work done. They're not putting that, that mortgage of a student loan on their back. They're able to you know, pay this off in a you know, relatively quick sort of way. The advantage I had as a, as a young person going to Southeastern Massachusetts University is that it was extremely affordable. And so you could work and pay college off at the same time. Uh, those days are, are long gone, and I'm not blaming anybody or anything for that. It's just where we are today. So looking at that reality, the fact that our students have options, I think, is an incredible opportunity, especially in a labor market where 30% of all of the jobs that are going to exist in the next 20 years uh, don't exist right now. So in terms of trying to prepare for that type of a future, the, the most important thing we can teach here is for students to get a well-rounded education, be extremely employable, but also be persistent and have malleability so that you know, as markets shift, they can, they can make the shift as well and continue to support their families and community. Just for our freshmen at the freshman level is they get their OSHA 10 certification. Um, that's huge in industry, it's, it's, a, it's mandatory to have, so yeah. they're getting that from day one. As soon as yeah. they get placed in their number one shops in January, they get right in onto the website, do the OSHA 10 training, and they all get certified. And that went very smooth this year. They're going to leave our school, uh, our program, with the OSHA 10 certificate, um, which is uh, it's a full 10-hour intensive safety course. Um, not specific so much to auto collision, but safety in general. So even if they find their way into another trade at some point, they have that behind them as well. Um, and we're working with ICAR and ASC uh, to get students uh, with some sort of certification before they leave here as well. So they have a little more behind them than just their high school diploma. One of the things, the challenges that we face is, and it's our job to educate the population, is that the world of technical education has changed significantly. You know, the, the days of walking into an auto collision program and seeing all of the paint blowing all over the environment and, you know, uh, banging fenders out, that, that's all gone. Um, the vehicles are equipped with all types of technology right now, including Lysar and radar. You're not banging out fenders. Eh? You need clean rooms for that. So that's a huge paradigm shift from 1968 when the auto collision program was first created over there. Our vision is to see that we're following with those trades. We have to update our programs with yep. those trades so yep. our students are able to 
basically hopefully walk right into these jobs that they're getting and be able yeah. to fit right in like a glove and be able to use the same equipment that they're using um, going up to a machine and knowing what it's called and not being surprised like yeah. I don't know what that is yeah. our program we want to have that that equipment and training for our students so when they get these jobs and they're getting the jobs and yeah. they're keeping their jobs yeah. we want them to succeed at that so in our shop in auto collision we are teaching the students on the basics of all the aspects of auto collision repair. So anything from minor fender bender damage to structural damage to cosmetic damage um, and as simple as washing and detailing the vehicle. So starting in freshman year the students learn all the basics of uh, using uh, hand tools, safety with the shop equipment, uh, basic painting, basic paint preparation, basic dent repair and as they move on into sophomore, junior and senior year all of that becomes more advanced. Uh, the upper class of the juniors and seniors will be involved in more uh, welding on panels. Uh, they'll be working on our frame machine, which is a state-of-the-art uh, frame straightening machine, where we can take a car that has its either frame or its unibody that has damage to it and bring it back to the correct dimensions so that it's safe again and that when we put it back together, everything fits the way that it's supposed yeah. to be again. Um, it's, it's one of the best machines we can get out there. It's, it's fully digital with measuring and everything. Um, in our uh, related classroom, we do all the theory for everything that the students are going to learn here. So the theory and the science, they will learn in the classroom. So they're going to learn um, all the specifics about everything that we're doing here in the shop. Uh, they get involved in all the safety, um, all the regulations and rules, exactly what's happening when metal gets bent. You mentioned the pipeline. Uh, I tell most of my seniors now, if they don't have a direct plan, we can help them with companies across the country. In some cases, even with a family, they will move the whole family out, enroll them in school, uh, travel them out, all pay, because they're so desperate for welders, especially on the pipelines. Yeah. It is incredible. Uh, most of the welders uh, out there today and in the past years, it's a tough trade. We usually make it around my age, 57, 58, and we start looking at retirement. Yeah. Not a lot of young people are willing, except for the students we have here, that yeah. really well, step up to the plate. Way to come into a dirty trade, tough trade, yeah. which pays huge money yeah. to keep it going. And that's where a welder shortage has come from. Mm -hmm. So valuable to us here is this program. And we've had people visit this program and, and can't believe the caliber of it. Yeah. And we're so proud of that. We, we, we want to get folks from the outside of, of our district to come get us students. And they're doing that as well. We've had employees over the border in Rhode Island looking for our students here in the program, uh, as far as Plymouth, Taunton, Mansfield, coming yeah. down to get our students. We try to get our students to have the skills and the high quality they need so they can be employable and be a value yep. to their employees. And they have been. They've been holding their jobs. They've been there for years. Some of our graduates have been with their co-op employees now for 15 years after graduation. Wow. Realistically, our culinary program needs a test kitchen. We do a remarkable job of, of producing food for, for the communities. But the reality is, is uh, as we look at an ever-increasing population on the world front, we realize that proteins, uh, either through the ocean or, or through um, you know, husbandry, is going to become limited. We, we can't feed the 9 billion people who are going to be here um, in, in, in 20 years. So part of what they need to do is start working on plant-based uh, proteins and other things like that. We started this program going back about six, seven years now. Um, we started doing peanut butter powder before it even went on the shelves. Okay. Um, we started working with a little bit of uh, molecular gastronomy, which is the study of food properties while they cook and through the process as they cook. Yeah. Um, some of the things we talk about is, you know, why does, why when we cook steak, why does it brown? Why does it look desirable to have? The academic challenges that students face in the technical area are greater and greater, and that's why you know, we've always known that people who, who think that, you know, somewhere along the line, uh, a vocational education is sort of a secondary academic education. We've known for 50 years that this is a laughable premise, but, you know, people are going to believe whatever they believe because of the fact that it's really tough to change a fixed mindset. But I would argue with you that in a, in a vehicle that's going to drive itself, which within the next five years you're going to see somewhere between one in five and one in seven vehicles have autonomous features. Um, there's a lot of uh, high-tech information that's going to have to be relayed to the technicians who work on these cars. Augmented uh, reality, um, artificial intelligence, 
And this is going throughout all of the programs. And one of the things that we're trying to do as an administration and a teaching staff is we're trying to predict this stuff by looking at markets. We know automated vehicles are coming uh, because, quite frankly, people will not stop texting and driving. And the reality is, is that there is a cost, uh, in, you know, obviously in human, uh, but also in, 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 in insurance and, and other claims. So we see this, this transformation happening and we need to get our program, again, which was built in 1968, prepared not only with the equipment, but with the physical space in order to do that type of learning. It's a different type of learning. And therein lies the challenge for the, the community at Diamond Regional. It is to understand that we are functioning in a building. We've always been punching above our weight. But we are functioning in a building that is clearly antiquated. And we are, if we don't do something about that, we will be functionally obsolescent, if not in 10 years, within the next 20 years. And, and when people say, well, that's a long time from now. Um, no, it's really not in terms of history, you know. Um, you know, we're looking at so many different challenges and our staff is excited about, you know, doing the legwork necessary to meet those challenges, but are restricted by the limitations of this building and there are many. For example, this room, I have room for 10 freshmen and 10 sophomores next year. So sophomores and freshmen will be in this room next year. Okay. The next year we have to expand and we have to take over either another classroom uh, not basic, but we do have to take over another classroom uh, to make room for the juniors and then the seniors, which I'm hoping we'll be able to fit together and we'll have to hire another instructor as well. But beyond that, I mean, we don't have room here to expand the program beyond the 10 students that I can take each cycle, unfortunately. Some of the, uh, the newer technologies we need to keep up with and we end up running, you know, running out of space. This, this room itself was designed for an electronics program of the 60s and things have drastically changed in the last 50 um, years. We have an, an unbelievable team here. Uh, this, this administrative and uh, teaching staff and, and, and the support staff because they need to be mentioned as well. Um, this is really a, uh, a ground up organization that uh, uh, there are many people. Um, just recently we were speaking to the uh, Parent Advisory Council. Um, you know, we had two members of the alumni who are in their 70s laying uh, the uh, mem memory bricks you know, to support our student learning here. So we have a, a tremendous family here, uh, alumni, the Bengal Foundation, who really are uh, instrumental in, in providing uh, our kids with what is hopefully a very unique and outstanding education. Diamond is always going to be recognized in building a display case for uh, Logan Airport. Uh, no other school has had that opportunity to do it. Uh, we feel grateful that they actually uh, approach us to build this, uh, this piece. Yeah, I mean, we're fortunate. I mean, our students want to be here. They want to get in the trades. They, they're, you know, concerned about their careers. They're, they're concerned about their academic grades. I mean, you want to go on co-op, you have to hold a certain grade level in your academics yep. to stay out there in the field. So, I mean, they are definitely held accountable, and they're very responsible. I mean, they're young teenagers, and, I mean, we're impressed every year with how well they're doing and how well they're moving forward. Now more than ever do we need a, a, a school that is not a 7.30 to 2.30 school, but is in fact a, a, a community resource that is open from you know, six in the morning until 10 at night. And so you know, we have a lot of adults who would love, not just for employment, but for enrichment. Um, we ran a soap making course this year that was wildly popular. Um, you know, people want to have these opportunities and the quality of life in the community sometimes isn't just about the labor issue, but it's what is offered beyond that. We're at 70% returning right now to do the continuing education here at Diamond. They, we have a great evening school program here. Uh, the electrical program is, is alive and well here at night and we do the journeyman classes. And a lot of our graduates, a very a large number of our graduates last year are in the evening school program to finish that time. I mean, the night school programs are big. We have uh, our students who graduate from here. Um, they get accredited certain time and certain tiers in the plumbing program. There's five tiers. They get accredited for tier one and tier two. So as soon as they graduate, they go right into the code and theory for tier three. The goal is to have the program completed in less than 180 days. And that way it's not a three-year program. They're out there with the skills that they need, not only to get them uh, into, the, uh, into the field, but to sustain them. And then give them the opportunity to come back later on 
intake refresher courses or as technology improves, and it does, technology is changing every six months in most of those fields to come back and get, and get the skills and the tools that they need. The reality is that this isn't just for the diamond community, but it's for the community in whole. The return on investment is going to be phenomenal. I mean, the business owners that graduate from Diamond Regional that are still in this area are amazing. You know, we, we, we have a running joke that, you know, you, you can't throw a snowball at a truck without hitting a diamond uh, business because it's, it's, they're everywhere. Now, you know, quite frankly, we should be expanding our offerings to our comprehensive brethren because those students have a right to this type of education too. And, and when you take a look at you know, the, the number of students who have access to technical education, even if it's not in a six and a half hour schedule, but have some access to it, they, they tend to perform better both um, in terms of employment and in terms of uh, performance uh, in post-secondary education. So this, 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 this push towards a new school is not just about Diamond Regional, but it's about, you know, the four sending communities and improving the communities, not just secondary students, but the you know adult learners who are disaffected. We just had a layoff of 160 workers over at Phillips. The reality is, if those, if we can train people to have skills that cannot be outsourced, um, this this type of thing will not happen. But it will take a commitment on the part of the community and the foresight to understand that. Uh, a, a short investment now um, is going to pay great dividends later because this building is going to exist one way or another yeah. and to fix this building is going to be incredibly costly so when you take a look at a reimbursement rate of 72.43% you know, um, it's, it's pennies on a dollar and, and uh, you know I'm never I'm never cavalier about taxpayer money because I am a taxpayer and uh, uh, that's why we're very serious about you know, trying to save wherever we can, but we're, we're looking at infrastructural issues that are going to be in the tens of millions of dollars if we're going to continue to function. How many more students we can reach, how, how much more we could improve the trades, it's, it's earth shattering. I just, I, that's all I could say. I always like to thank all of our stakeholders and I could go through the list and I'm always afraid to go through the list. Uh, because you always forget somebody, but you know, this is a blanket thank you to the community for first of all the support that they provide for us, um, but also you know a, a clarion call that if we are going to exist as a premier technical school, we need to put ourselves in a position to be able to you know support that type of learning, and that's going to require the community to come forward and give us the support that they need. Some of the most respectable, talented kids I've ever met. I mean, we have a lot of success in every sport, not just here, yeah. but I'm super proud of the athletes we have here because we make sure we build them into strong athletes and strong yeah. individuals in general.
every year I don't know how I could love it anymore, but somehow I get new athletes and they kind of like refresh the whole entire sport and they make you love it even more every time. On behalf of the Diamond community, I'd like to thank uh, Somerset Access Television and certainly Tom Norton for featuring all of our programs here at the school. Um, his generosity in terms of time is, is most appreciated. Uh, our students were very excited to be uh, able to highlight what they do. They are extremely proud of that and, and so certainly the first thanks I want to give is to Somerset Access. I also want to thank Governor Baker as well as uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito and uh, our legislative delegation. They have been huge supporters of Diamond Regional and they see the value of technical education and have actually you know, put the money there to help us do the types of high-tech things that we need to do. We're going to continue to need their support. Uh, additionally, on a more local level, we want to thank certainly uh, the select people, finance committee people, the city council in Fall River, the mayor of Fall River, for the support they too have given us uh, in an effort for us to carry out our mission, uh, to provide education for uh, all students and all types of education. Moving forward, we're going to continue to need their support. The fact of the matter is, is that you know, we are in the MSBA pipeline for a uh, desperately needed new school. And you know, in, a, in a time where of, of fiscal austerity, the reality is, is the natural inclination is to pull back. We need the help of the communities and we need the foresight of the communities and the stakeholders throughout to understand that Diamond Regional is a return on investment, not just for your children, but for the community at large. You know, um, Again, I can't express how grateful I am uh, to everybody involved and I, I know special thanks to our instructional staff, our uh, you know, ancillary staff, our advisors, our volunteers. Um, they are the ones that every day slug it out to make sure that the education for Diamond students uh, is a very special education. And so I would be, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank them for everything they do. And as we move towards the uh, feasibility study over the next 270 days, I'm looking forward to uh, offering an opportunity to speak with all of the stakeholders who may have questions in regards to uh, the MSBA process or Diamond Regional in general. We really want you to know because, you know, uh, it was uh, not too long ago one of our representatives said to us that the community doesn't know what you're doing. Well, part of what you know, Somerset Access is doing and, and Tom Norton is to try and provide an opportunity for people to see what we're doing because uh, I truly believe that what we are doing is incredibly special, not just in terms of economics, not just in terms of academia, but in terms of supporting a community that is desperate for the type of uh, workmanship and, and education that we think will move this community forward going forward. So I want to thank you again for your time, and I look forward to both hearing, and, uh, hearing from you and seeing you.